about that, though, we need to talk about Jehovah and what Jehovah means. So the top blank, Yahweh, Lord, blank. Anyone know what goes in there? Anyone ever done a study on the names of God? Yahweh means what? Yahweh means Lord Jehovah. So first blank, right in Jehovah. We need to talk about that because that's the basis of everything we're going to talk about today is Jehovah. Jehovah means the existing one or Lord. The chief meaning of Jehovah is derived from the Hebrew word Hava, meaning to exist or to be. It also suggests to become, specifically to become known. This means that God wants to reveal himself uncensor uncensorly. He wants it to be with great force. He wants you to know who He is. We've got the God of the universe who wants to be a part of your life. Let me say that again. The God of the universe wants to be a part of your life. Amen. And you're like, maybe you don't know what my life looks like, Jeremy. I don't care. God doesn't care. He wants to be a part of your life. He doesn't want to just be there whenever it's SOS calls. We've all been there. God, the wheels are falling off. I think I'm going to hit my knees now. He'll be there for you. But He wants to be there for you when days are good. When times are right. Whenever you're where you're supposed to be. God reveals Himself unceasingly. Again and again and again. Yahweh, Lord Jeho Jehovah. So with that, in the second one... We're going to go to Jehovah, Lord, my banner. We'll start there. N-I-S-S-I. -S -S These are all Hebrew. I'll give, them, give you guys the spelling, some of which you would have no clue, trust me. I'm going to try Sam. L. Burkhoff, in his Systematic Theology, a book he wrote, he said this, The names of God are not human inventions but divine origins through which are borrowed human language. God did not give us His names flippantly. He gave us His names specifically. And as it says here, they're not human inventions, they're divine origins. So the Lord my banner. Let's look at Exodus 17.15. Exodus 17, 50. We're going to read a lot of really short scripture passages just to get a little bit of a glimpse. We don't have time. If you would like to go through these more diligently, it would be worth the look. Exodus 17, 15 says, Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, Because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. So here we're seeing the Amalekites win against the Lord's people. The Lord was with them, and they defended them against their, uh, their foe. So the Lord, my banner. I want to talk about banner real quick. Moses recognized that the Lord was Israel's banner under which they defeated the Amalekites. Apart from God's power, let's just real quick take a glimpse at Israel. They were nothing. Israel was not a strong, mighty military force. They didn't have charioteers. They did not have great men of war. They were pretty much just a band of slaves that went into a promised land and took down walls and fortified cities and took out armies. And the reason they did was because of what? The Lord, my banner. He went before them. He was the power they had to succeed in what they did. And there are stories upon stories when the children of Israel turned their eyes away from God to themselves and they failed. They showed up as the mighty force they were and it showed up as nothing. If we don't have God on our side, we don't have a side. Let's realize that. So, he realized what it was. He built an altar named Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. Ness is sometimes translated as a pole with an insignia attached to it. 
In battle, opposing nations would fly their own flag on a pole at each of their respective front lines. This was to give their soldiers a feeling of hope and a focal point. This is what God is to us, a banner of encouragement to give us hope and a focal point. Let me rephrase that, or let me say it again. God is our banner of encouragement, and he gives us a hope and a focal point. Your life's going to hell? Look at the cross. Your marriage is on the rocks? Look at the cross. If your life is not where it's supposed to be, look at the cross. If your health isn't where it's supposed to be, look at the cross. He's your banner. When our country fought for its freedom against a tyrannical English government, there was a man on the field, or multiple men on the field, that had a job, and one job only, and that was to carry the flag of this country, sewed together by a lady named Betsy Ross, correct? Built a flag for our country, Stars and bars, the red, white, and blue, whatever you want to call it, our country had a flag to rally behind. If that person went down in gunfire, the next individual dropped his weapon and picked up that flag. More flag bearers died than any other because they had a flag above them. But they did not let that flag fall. It was their banner. It was what they rallied behind. In our Christian walks, the Lord God is our flag. He's our banner. He is our forebearer in anything we go into. And it's something we can rally to. If we lose sight of that, we lose sight of the reason why we're here. If God isn't the reason why we're here, if that isn't the reason why we're here, then we can leave and never come back. I've got way too many projects and way too many things on my plate to show up for a club. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. If God isn't our banner, there's no reason to be here. God is a banner of encouragement to give us hope and a focal point. Second one, Jehovah Ra, R-A-A-H, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I find this one very interesting and I love this one because a shepherd is one who cares for sheep, right? He cares for sheep. Anyone ever raise sheep? Chrissy, how smart is a sheep? Yeah, they're not smart. Sheep aren't smart animals. They need a shepherd. They need someone to care for them. Naturally, if you put sheep on their own, domesticated sheep on their own out to graze, come winter time, you're going to have dead sheep. They're not going to make it. They don't have the ability on their own to make it. And you may find this harsh, you might find this rough, but Christians on their own can't make it. We need a shepherd, you guys. I don't want to make it on my own. I'm a messed up, screwed up individual. And God's a mighty God. And when you mix a messed up, screwed up individual with a mighty God, you know what you get? Righteous. Not in my ability, but in His ability. Not in my options, but in His options. Psalms 23.1 The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He is who keeps us safe. Correct? So let's look at this real quick. An extended translation of the word Ra is friend or companion. This indicates the intimacy God desires between himself and his people. When the two words are combined, Jehovah Ra, it can be translated as the Lord my friend. Every one of us has seen someone who cares for animals and someone who doesn't care for animals, correct? My sister, Charity, cares for animals. She's got rabbit. I don't even, I'm not even going to where she has. I don't, know, I don't even know what she has. But she cares for animals. If you, got, if you find a little baby bird that needs a, its leg splint and going to grow back, Charity will do it. 
If, if there's someone hurting, Charity's at the scene because she has a compassionate friend heart. God wants to be that for us. He isn't here when we go out of line, when we're out wandering, when we're doing something foolish. God doesn't come alongside you and say, you idiot. Why'd you do that again? He could, couldn't he? He has all the justification in the world to do that. But he doesn't. Because God isn't here to corral us like cattle. He's here to lead us and guide us with a comforting, friend-like hand like sheep. The Lord my friend, the Lord my shepherd. Jehovah Ra. So we've seen Jehovah Nisi and Jehovah Ra, the Lord my banner, the Lord my shepherd. Now, third, Jehovah Rapha, R A P H A, the Lord that heals. Now, this one I had to spend some time on. God will heal a goat for a lady in Russia. God will heal a goat for a lady in Russia. Scripture talks about how God cares more for us than the birds of the air or the beasts of the field. God wants to heal you. God wants to heal you. Not in my time, maybe not in your time, but definitely in His time. But let me ask this question, and this is what made me stick on this. Why aren't we seeing healings in America today? And I believe I got a word from my wife on this subject, because I asked her, and she popped off right away, and she said, because we don't need them. We're too comfortable. That lady, when her goat was dying and died, she was desperate. It was it. That's all she had. So many times we rationalize our way out of God being God. We rationalize our way out of God being our healer. I've been guilty of it. And as you grow up seeing this, Jehovah Rapha, God our healer, the Lord that heals but you never see a healing, you begin to get calloused, and you begin to quit believing. At least I do. And maybe I'm not speaking for anyone but myself on this one. But I firmly believe that God wants to renovate our mindset on His healing powers. Can God use our infirmities to bring change in our lives? Yes, He can. And there, I believe that things are allowed for a reason. I believe there are things that happen be it simply because we're a fallen country, or a fallen world. But I do also believe this, God wants to heal us. So let's look at this, Jehovah Rapha. Again, R-A-P-H-A. -A. Exodus 15.26 He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in His eyes, if you pay attention to His commands and keep all of His decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on Egypt. For I am the Lord God who heals you. People of Israel at this point in time, are in the desert, wandering, wondering, contemplating, questioning. And God is beginning to instill in them values, beginning to instill in them mindsets. And one of those is this, you don't have to look any further than me to be your healer. I am your healer. 
This is the other thing that the longer I have followed God and the more I've done research into who He is, I've come to the conclusion of this, it's not a free ride. People want to make it a free ride. People want to make it a deal of, I said a prayer when I was seven years old at the altar, and so naturally, I am promised all of these benefits. And in a way, they're right. And in a way, they're dead wrong. I don't believe that we're called to be Christians who say a prayer, live life like we want, and expect the rewards of the kingdom. We say a prayer, we live lives according to His precepts and His commands, and we benefit from it. But if we live our life our way, on our terms, how do you expect to be blessed by God? And I know that's not popular. I know that's not going to bring a ton of people in. But I think it'd be lying to them if we did something else. It'd be lying to them to say, you can live however you want, and you'll be blessed. There are things that bring blessing and things that bring curses. Right here it says, He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in His eyes, if you pay attention to His commands and keep His decrees, I will, bring you, I will not bring you any of the diseases I brought to Egypt. Does that mean that no bad things will ever happen to good people? No. That doesn't mean that. Adam and Eve still ate a fruit in a garden and it caused sin to enter the world. We've got to remember that. But God said, I want to be the Lord that heals you. I want to be Jehovah Rapha. The next one. So we got the banner, the shepherd, the healer. Next one, Jehovah Shama. S-H-A-M-M-A-H. S-H-A-M-M-A-H. The Lord is there. The Lord is there. How many people want a God who takes vacations? How many people want a God that takes vacations? Sorry, it's not my duty weekend, right Josh? I don't got calmed out of this week. I'm off. Don't think about asking me for any favors because I'm off. That's not the God we want, is it? I want a God that's 24-7, 365. I want a God that's there when I need Him. I want a God that's there whenever I need to cry out to Him. I want a God that's there. I don't want busy signals. Anyone ever call Pastor Casey and not get anyone? Where is he at? Perfect. I can talk about him. I don't want a God that puts me to voicemail. I want a God that says, yes, my son, what is it? I want a God that's going to go into the trenches with me when I'm in the trenches. I want a God that's going to go on the mountaintops with me whenever life's great. And I want a God that's going to be in the valleys with me, in the muck and the mire whenever I'm sludging through. Because that's life. I want a God that'll be there. Ezekiel 48:31. Ezekiel 48.35 I forgot to read the uh, definition of Rapha and I'll do it in just one second. Because I wanted to touch on one thing in there I forgot. Rapha means to restore, to heal, to make healthful. In Hebrew, there were the two words that are combined here, and that's Jehovah Rapha. It can be translated as the Jehovah who heals, our Jehovah who heals. Jehovah is the great physician who heals the physical, and this is it, emotional needs of His people. God isn't there just to fix the headaches, the heartaches. Sorry, God's not just there to fix the headaches, He's there to fix the heartaches. 
God is there to heal not only the physical finite body, but He's more so even there to, to heal our, our emotions, our hearts and our souls. There are people who die every year that there's nothing wrong with them, <laughs> except for a broken heart, except for depression, despair, whatever it is. If you don't have that right with God, then you can still be a dying person. So keep that in mind. God's not only here to fix our headaches, He's also here to fix our heartaches. Ezekiel 48.35 This is talking about the gates of the new city, and it goes through... But this is what I want to talk about. So we've seen a lot as, as Ezekiel went and they rebuilt the, uh, the, the city and the gates were put up and, and they were going and they were talking about the distance all around will be 1,800 cubits. Uh, that doesn't matter here, but this is what does. And the name of the city from that time on will be the Lord is there. Israel had a rough time. It's called exile. It's called turning your back from God and being punished for it. No other way around it. But he came back and he made a promise to his people, the Lord is there. Now, how many people have direct descent, Jewish descent in the place? Anyone have direct Jewish descent in the place? I don't. I'm not raising my hand. I'm Norwegian. There's a lot of, there's a lot of promises right here that don't apply to me. I'm not going to claim them. They're not mine to claim. I'm not a Jew. But there are a lot of promises in here that work both for God's people, the Jews, and God's people, the Gentiles. Because we're adopted into His family. So, we, I think, be careful whenever you go into promises in Scripture, put it through that filter. Is this for God's people, the family, or is this for God's people, the Jewish nation? There is blessing for the Jewish nation. There really is. There's also blessing for people who support the Jewish nation. The American government better realize that. I'm going to throw that out there. I'm not trying to get political on you, but I'll tell you right now, you want to see America become nothing? Oppose the Jewish nation. I believe it'll happen. Which we're working our way towards right now. The Lord is there. Jehovah Shammah. Shammah is derived from the Hebrew word Sham, which can be translated as there. Jehovah Shammah is a symbol, symbolic name for the earthly Jerusalem. The name indicates that God has not abandoned Jerusalem, leaving it in ruins, but that there will be restoration. There will be restoration in the end times, won't there? We will see a restoration of His people and Him. And I hope that we can be a part of that. The church can be a part of that. You know, that is one of the hardest groups to witness to because they have all the answers. They're missing one thing, and it's called a Messiah. It's called a Roman cross 2,000 some odd years ago. They missed it. Many have seen the light. Many have not. If you have influence into people's lives, into true traditional Jewish lives be salt and light. Okay, we're going to move on. Okay, this is when they get a little funky. Jehovah Tiskanu. Okay, you ready for it? T-S-I-D-K-E-N-U The Lord our righteousness. T S I. D K E N U, the Lord our righteousness. We're going to look at a couple scriptures on this. Go to Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 
As I said earlier, I am not righteous. You can ask my mom. She always said if I was the first child, I'd have been an only child. So that must mean after that it must have gotten a lot better because she had seven. <laughs> I've come to the conclusion if I'd have been born ten years sooner, they would have t given me a terminology of ADD. I can't sit still long. I'm slightly spastic. Um, I was kind of a crazy kid. I remember slight, putting holes in bike tires and doing all sorts of crazy things as a kid. I needed God. Let me say that again. I needed God. I had a short fuse. You can ask Casey that. Um, I needed God. <coughs> The more I realized it, I needed God. Because my righteousness was not righteousness. He needed to be the Lord my righteousness. That's what I needed Him to be in my life. You know what? If it wasn't for God, you know what I'd do? I'd drink probably. I'd probably be addicted. Alcoholism runs in my family. I'd probably be a drunkard. I couldn't control my temper. I already know that. I wouldn't be a good person. There are those people without God that are generally good people. It's their disposition. I wasn't one of them. Their righteousness is still filthy rags, but my righteousness is still filthy rags. God needed to be my righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 6. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteous Savior. The Lord our righteous Savior. Let's jump ahead a few pages to 33, Jeremiah 33, 16. Maybe. Find that page. Yeah. Mine's 742. I don't have notes in mine. <clears throat> 3316. In those days Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called the Lord our righteous Savior. Tiskanu is derived from the meaning which means to be stiff or to be straight or righteous. In Hebrew, when the two words are combined, Jehovah Tiskanu, it may be translated as the Lord who is our righteousness. I like that. Stiff or straight. What does the world want us to be? No, they don't. They want us to be flexible. They want us to just, you know what, don't, don't be that stick in the mud. You know, if all the guys are going out to drink, come out and drink, dude. It's not a big deal. You know what, if, if they're going to pass around the phone with that text message on it, with those pictures, you know, just look. It's okay. Don't be a stick in the mud. Don't be stiff. Just go with it. You know, all of you in the room that are younger in school still are going into college or going into the workforce, it doesn't change. They still want you to bend. They don't want someone who stands their ground. Because they get it's uncomfortable. I've put a lot I've had a lot of people put cell phones away when I walk into the circle. And I'm proud of that. I'm proud of the fact they know where I stand. Make it where they know that you're stiff. Make it know, known that it, you're straight. You're not going to go down the path they go. The only time I was ever asked to go to the bar was at 2 o'clock in the morning when I had to go pick up a whole bunch of guys from where I work that couldn't drive home. And I was glad they knew they could call me. I showed up at 2 and drove them all home. They didn't ask me to drink with them that night, but they did ask me to bring them home the next morning. The point is this. We're called to be straight in a crooked world. Now we're going to have a sermon on that in a little bit. It's going to be kind of fun. I'm going to do some crazy things in the church. I'm not going to hurt anyone, I hope, but it'll be cool.
So we'll talk more about that, about being straight in a crooked world. But He is our righteousness. He is our Lord. Let's go on to the next one and final one. Running out of time. Jehovah M. Kadesh. Now, you ready for it? And I, I actually looked this up. This is how you pronounce it, but it's not how it's spelled. M-E-K-O-D-D-I-S-H-K-E-M. You ready for it again? M-E-K-O-D-D-I-S-H-K-E-M. E-M, yes. M. Kadesh. And that's how it's pronounced. M. Kadesh. M E K O D D I S H K E M. Do I have a bingo? Okay, good. Good. M. Kadesh, derived from the Hebrew word Kadesh, means sanctified or holy or dedicated. Sanctification is the separation of an object or person, person to the dedication of the Holy Spirit. Now let's say that again. Sanctification is the separation of an object or person to the dedication of the Holy Spirit. When the two words are combined, Jehovah and Kadesh, it can be translated as the Lord who sets you apart. When we become Christians, there should be a leaving. Our lives should change. Because all of a sudden, the temple of the Holy Spirit is now being filled with the Holy Spirit. Before that, it's not the Holy Spirit. It's our wills and our desires and our ways. So there should be a change. There should be a change of dedication to, from us to God. From our will to His will. From our ways to His ways. Now, unless you're different than me, my ways aren't His ways, and my thoughts aren't, thoughts aren't His thoughts. For His thoughts are much higher than my thoughts, and His ways are much higher than my ways. Exodus 31, 13. I entitle this, All I Need. God's all you need, you guys. He's it. You don't need drugs. You don't need alcohol. You don't need tobacco. You don't need pornography. You don't need that relationship that's wrong. You don't need those sport teams. You don't need any of that. Some of it's very bad. Some of it's very detrimental. Some of it might not even be bad. But whatever we put in front of God that becomes an idol in our life becomes bad. And, and I'm as guilty as the next. I found myself in idol worship, not to a graven image, to a thing called money. To a thing called vehicles. Anyone in the house like to wrench on their toys? We do it. We find ourselves at that point where all of a sudden it becomes more important than God. More important than His. Whenever you get the phone call and you need to go help someone from the church who needs you to pray for them and you're like, but I'm working on my truck. What's more important? What's going to be your idol? What's going to set you apart? All I need. God is all I need. God is all we need in 2015. And if we realize that God is everything, then we'll realize that the world means nothing. The cares of this life will grow dim in light of His glory, right? Amen. So let's real quick read this. It's titled, The Sabbath 13 says... Say to the Israelites, now this is when, when we're getting the law of God handed down. Say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbath. 
a day sacred, right? A day holy, a day set apart. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come. You may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. I am the Lord who makes you holy. What about self-help books? Do they make you holy? Well, what about really good preachers on TBS? Right, TBN. TBN? TBN. Do they make you holy? What about Pastor Jeremy or Casey or Dale? Do they make you holy? God makes you holy. He's the only one. He's it. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end. He is the one that makes us holy. He's the one that sanctifies us, sets us apart, gives us a calling, says, Anthony, your life is so much higher than you could have ever imagine because I'm going to sanctify you, set you apart at LRS, in your family, in Cheyenne with your friends, wherever it is, you're sanctified because I've set you apart. Every one of us, when we say, God, my life's not mine, it's yours, I'm putting my name on the sale part of the title and your name on the receiving part of the title. I no longer own this body. It's your body. You do with it what you want. When we do that, we're sanctified. We're set apart. He says, you know what? I'll take ownership and I'll make your life so much better than you could ever imagine. It's not a scary thing. This is a good thing, you guys. When we set ourselves apart and say, God, your holiness looks a lot better than my holiness. All I need. You're all I need. Next week we'll touch on a couple more. I know this is kind of... Ask God what you need from Him. Because each one of you needs something different. And you might be like, well, I've already asked for the things I need. Well, maybe let's, let's bring that into clarity here. Maybe it's something you don't know you need. Maybe it's a calling... Maybe God's got missionaries in this house today. Maybe God's got evangelists in this house today. Maybe God's got someone who just wants to come and clean windows and, and vacuum some floors in this house today. Maybe God says, you know what, I want you to be a beacon of light in your workplace, and you're not right now. Our prayer today is, God, what do I need from you? What equipping do I need in this walk? What does my sanctification look like? There was a man of God that once told me, Jeremy, on the walk, on this climb of the faith, there's no room to stop and enjoy the view. He says, because you're either going up or you're sliding down. When we as Christians get into a rut, like I was talking about, we have at this church this year. I feel at the end of this year, we found a rut. When we get into that rut, we find ourselves sliding back down. It's time to jump out of the rut, you guys, this year, and find something more in God. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning, God. We thank you that you are all we need. God, bring us to a point where we realize our inabilities and your ability.